Peace Corps gives us a chance to show a side of our country which is too often submerged. Our desire to live in peace, our desire to be of help. There can be no greater service to our country and no source of pride more real than to be a member of the Peace Corps of the United States. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the My Peace Corps Story Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Lloyd, and I'm here to help tell the stories of current and returned Peace Corps volunteers. If you like what you hear today, be sure to let me know over at MyPeaceCorpsStory.com and connect with me on Instagram at MyPeaceCorpsStory or on Facebook by searching for My Peace Corps Story. Additionally, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for the show. Five-star reviews are extremely appreciated, but more than anything, I want to know what you think so I can better serve my audience. Today, I am very pleased to welcome Catherine Cottom to the show. She served as an education volunteer in South Africa from July 2013 until November 2013. Now, she only served five months because she was medically separated after she developed bipolar disorder. We talk about her history with mental health issues, the Peace Corps, and everything that happened, not only about mental health, but the good things as well about her service. And then we start to talk about what people can do if they see signs of mental health issues in themselves and in others. This is a very important episode for any volunteer who's about to go into Peace Corps, current volunteers, or anybody. If you are going through something right now, I implore you to reach out and get help. I talk about my previous preconceived notions about mental health before I entered in the Peace Corps and when I reached out. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call someone. This is this is this is this is my my Peace Corps Peace Corps my Peace Corps my Peace Corps story story story. My name is Catherine Cottom, and this is my Peace Corps story. Hello, Catherine. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Doing great. Uh, excited to speak with you today. You have a very unique, interesting story, as does everybody who serves in the Peace Corps. But yours is one that I, I'm really interested in talking with you today, just given some of the stuff that I also went through in Peace Corps. Um, so it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on. It's an honor. Well, thank you. I feel really honored that you've decided to speak with me. Well, just starting off, uh, I'd like for you to let everybody know, you know, who you are, uh, where you served in Peace Corps, what you were doing, and just any other background information that you want people to know before we get into your Peace Corps story. Okay. My name is Catherine. I am 28 years old. I currently live in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, Before Peace Corps, I already had mental health stuff going on. So from the time I was 13, I've struggled with depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And from the time I was 17, I've been on medications. So when I went through the application process, they were pretty rigorous with the health portion. And I had to get a bunch of doctors and like my therapist and my psychiatrist to all sign off on me going Mm -hmm. beforehand. Um, But now I have actually a podcast with my one of my best friends about mental health Mm -hmm. and I keep a blog but I'm still not working Mm -hmm. um I'm on workers compensation from the Peace Corps Mm -hmm. I just recently had to be hospitalized again actually I have bipolar disorder which I developed in the Peace Corps which I'm sure we'll talk about later but I was just in the hospital from August 4th to the 14th because of a manic episode and rapid cycling between mania and depression. Well, um, I, I'm glad you're out and you're able to just, you know, too. better and talk with me today. Yeah. I feel a lot more grounded and mm-hmm. just a lot clearer and mm-hmm. better. Mm-hmm. And so where did you serve in Peace Corps and when, what were what were you doing there? Uh, so I served in South Africa and I was a education volunteer, an education volunteer. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was teaching English to fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Mm -hmm. But I never really ended up teaching that much English because I wasn't there for that long. Um, Primarily, primarily I worked with the library and I had like a reading club after school because I was still sort of getting into the swing of things. But the volunteer that was there before me got all these books donated and they were in boxes. And so we sorted them and put them in a room and 
made a library. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, yeah. Anybody who has served in the Peace Corps knows that, you know, once you start off, you're not really doing your job. You're just trying to figure things out, you know, figure out new languages in your community. Well, I guess getting getting into it, one of the things I like to start off just asking uh, people who come on the show are, uh, what are one of your favorite Peace Corps memories, if you could share that with us? So that's easy for me because it's one of my favorite memories ever. Mm-hmm. I was walking down the street. I decided to go on a walk and um, there were these two kids playing like patty cake with their hands and they saw me and they said, Maputi, because that was my name in the training village. What are you doing? And I said, I'm going for a walk. And they said, why? <laughs> they said, I want to see the village. And they said, can we come with you? And I said, yes. And so then we ran into some more kids and then we ran into some more kids. And eventually I was looking back in my diary. There were like 15 kids with me. Mm-hmm. I was like the Pied Piper of children here <laughs> in the village. And uh, we were just walking around the village and singing head, shoulders, knees and toes and sepeti and just laughing and playing. And it was pure joy. Mm-hmm. No, that that's almost like one of those iconic sort of Peace Corps memories where, you know, just connecting with the kids and you just feel that you're a part of a community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, so did you, you finished out training and then went Mm -hmm. to your, your host site? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. That was in Simanyani, a little village in Limpopo province. Okay. And what was that like? So I, you know, living in that village, because I served in Burkina Faso, but you know, it's, Big Africa is a big continent. So, what was it your is. what it was your village like? Can you explain a little bit about the terrain, the people, the cultures? Yeah. So, my village actually was like right across the road from a hospital. Mm-hmm. So, a lot of people worked at the hospital, and you had to walk up to the hospital or catch a taxi up to the hospital to go into town. Um, everyone had cell phone, but not everyone always had electricity, mm-hmm. which I thought was interesting. Like everyone had cell phones. Um, The kids and the women were not treated well, Mm -hmm. in my opinion. But that's like my Westerner's opinion coming in. Um, Like the teachers would have the kids wash their cars during the school day when they were supposed to be learning. Or they would send them to the shop to get soda for them during class. The teachers would be like texting and on their cell phones (laughs) during class and not teaching. It was, uh, that part was frustrating Mm -hmm. and seeing like the very, very traditional gender roles of like women cook and clean and do all the housework and men don't do those things typically. Mm -hmm. We've given a little bit of background of your, your favorite memory, you going into your village, what you were doing. I guess the thing I'm most interested in is, you know, talking about the, the mental health issues that, that you went through and, I, yeah. I want to just preface it for everybody. Some of, some of my, my hesitations, one, with this conversation, because I myself don't know if I am equipped with the vocabulary to to talk about this well. So I'm going to apologize you know, if I, if I overstep as I'm trying to explore this with you. But at the same time, I experienced some of these issues myself in my, in my service. And I'm almost ashamed to say it, but before Peace Corps and before experiencing depression, no depression myself, that I sort of, I judged people that, you know, said that they were, you know, depressed or were suffering through depression because I just always thought, and I, since I had never experienced it, you're like, okay, yeah, you're sad. You're sad and you just, you just got to get over it. Like, okay, you're sad because of X. So let's figure out the root of X, find a solution, solve the problem, and then you're happy again, right? Like, it's easy as that. It's just, you know, it's, it's, not that hard until I went through an episode myself in Peace Corps where there was just no getting out of it. I mean, there was, it was month after month of me just not wanting to leave my house and just doubting my being in the Peace Corps and, you know, all the decisions I'd made up until that point. And then I eventually reached out to Peace Corps and told him, I was like, look, I need help. You know, I need to talk to somebody about the stuff I'm going through. And they set me up with a psychiatrist that would call me and we, you know, sort of work through some of the stuff. You know, they would call me once a week and we'd have these long conversations and it helped me get through it. And because of that experience, I want you to, to sort of talk, talk us through what happened to you so people can, I guess, get a better understanding of you 
and how to maybe reach out sooner and deal with some of the issues that they might be experiencing. Yeah, sure. So I actually, when I got to South Africa, I was happier than I've ever been in in my life. And I kind of think that might have been the beginnings of a manic episode um, without me knowing it yet, because I had never been manic before Peace Corps. And a manic episode is where you have lots of energy and you talk a lot and you have pressured speech and you might participate in risk-taking behaviors. Um, You feel sort of ecstatic sometimes. Sometimes you can be really irritable. Um, But after that, it wasn't that long until I started becoming depressed. And because I got there in July and around August, I started feeling really sad And not really homesick. Like, I didn't want to leave. I wanted to make it work. But I just, my antidepressants that I was on were no longer working. And for some people, it is like a situational thing. And therapy is enough to fix it. But I have chemical imbalances in my brain, um, which we know for, for certain now with the bipolar disorder. But I got depressed in August. And in on September 1st, actually, which is four years ago today, um, I wrote in my diary that I had my first suicidal thought of the fall tonight Um, because it was cyclical for me before that. And I had had several suicidal thoughts in the fall in past Mm -hmm. years. Um, Yeah. So I became suicidal. I was having suicidal thoughts. I told one of my friends about it in September and she said, you need to reach out to Peace Corps. And Mm -hmm. I said, no, um, I was afraid that they would send me home. I was afraid that they would say I was too sick to work. I was afraid. I was really, really afraid of them Mm -hmm. separating me, which ultimately did happen, but not then or because of that. Um, so that was September 1st. I think September 20th around September 20th is when we went to permanent site And I just was really struggling to get out of the bed, to do anything in my community. Um, Like I was going to school and coming home and holding up in my room Mm -hmm. and watching Breaking Bad. Um, Because I just didn't, I didn't want to be around people. I was really sad. I just, it was bad. I was not doing well. And I still didn't reach out to Peace Corps until October Mm -hmm. 20th. Um, when I was feeling suicidal again and my friend said, you're going to call the PCMO or I'm going to call them for you. So it really took that kick in the butt for me to call them. But I called and I said, you know, this is what's happening. I'm having some suicidal thoughts. Um, I'm really depressed. I, I don't want to get out of bed. And they said, pack your things and come to Mm -hmm. Pretoria immediately. So I packed some stuff, um, Not a lot because they said just like pack for a week or two and got on the taxi and took the taxi into town and took several other taxis into Pretoria. And I'm trying to get to the Peace Corps office because they've made me a counseling appointment for that afternoon because they were like, we need to get you in quickly if you're having suicidal thoughts. And I didn't make it on time because the taxi wouldn't take me to the Peace Corps office. They kept trying to drop me off like mm-hmm. several blocks away. And I had been told not not to walk alone mm-hmm. in Pretoria. Um, so I eventually got there. I was crying. I was so upset. And they said, your appointment's been moved till tomorrow. So I went back to the backpackers and hung out there. They got me in with the therapist the next day. And I was seeing her actually okay. a couple times a week. Um, they, they, you know, asked me if I wanted to go home and I said, no. Um, then they got me in with a psychiatrist who changed my medication and he changed it from Celexa, which is an antidepressant to a different one called Cymbalta, which is also an SSRI, which is a type of antidepressant. And in people who have, uh, the genetic predisposition to develop bipolar disorder, if you take certain SSRIs, it can mm-hmm. knock you into mania. So it can knock you into your first manic episode. So I became really irritable. I didn't really know what was going on. Um, for like a week and a half or two weeks, probably, I was just really irritable. And I, 
people would invite me to do things and all I wanted to do was read all day and all night. And like, I was getting pissed off at other volunteers for being kind to me and inviting me to do things. And it just, it really wasn't me. Um, and then they told us that there were going to be like 90 kids coming into the backpack. That's what I was saying. And I said, I can't, I can't do that. Can you please move me somewhere else? And so they sent me to a bed and breakfast and I, ended up staying up all night dancing and singing, which are not things mm-hmm. that I typically do. Um, wrote to an ex-boyfriend on Facebook. Uh, just like didn't sleep. I slept for an hour that night and not sleeping is like a big indicator that a manic episode is happening. Um, so the next morning I was supposed to see the PCMO early in the morning. And so I got there and they were like, Oh, your appointment's been pushed back. And I'm thinking, Oh, this is so bad because I have a master's degree in counseling and an undergraduate degree in psychology. And by this point, I have finally figured out what is going on. Um, Because I had a cousin who had bipolar disorder and I studied bipolar disorder. And I was like, oh, Mm -hmm. shit, I'm manic. Um, And so I didn't see the doctor until late that afternoon. I saw a bunch of other Peace Corps volunteers and I'm just jabbering away the whole day because I can't stop talking. And I'm pacing because I can't stop moving. And I eventually see the PCMO and he, he says, what do you think is happening? And I said, I think I'm manic. And he said, I think you're right. Um, so what they did for me at that point was they called, uh, they called the Peace Corps medical people in Washington, D.C. And they talk, talked with them about like what my options were. And really, they, they gave me two options. Um, they said I could go to Washington, D.C. and do an inpatient stay at a hospital, mm-hmm. like on the mental health ward, or I could go home to my parents and try and get care there. Um, and I picked to come home to Asheville and seek care here because if you are not a danger to yourself or anyone else, they cannot make you mm-hmm. go to a mental hospital. Um, they can only do that if you're a danger to yourself or someone else. And I knew that I was neither of those things. And at the time I was terrified mm-hmm. of mental hospitals. So I was like, there's no way I'm doing that. Like, if you have to medevac Mm -hmm. me, send me home to Asheville. And I'm thinking, like, okay, I'll go home and I'll I'll go home to my village and I'll pack all my stuff up and then, you know, I'll go. Well, they wouldn't even let me go back to my village because they didn't want me to see my host family or the people in my village Mm -hmm. in the state that I was in. Um, Which was terribly upsetting to me because I ended up not getting to say goodbye to my host family. And I didn't get to pack any of my things. My friend Rosamond had to pack Mm -hmm. them all for me. Um, but they wouldn't even let me stay in the bed and breakfast for the next two nights or the night. It was one night or two night. I can't remember which one, but I had to stay at the PCMO's house in his daughter's bedroom because they like wanted to keep Mm -hmm. an eye on me. Um, so they actually even had another PCMO from another country had flown into South Africa because it was a medical hub. She was flying another PCV there. So she actually rode with me all the way from South Africa to Atlanta back to Asheville on the airplane because I needed mm-hmm. a babysitter, I guess. But so now looking back on it, do you feel that they did did the right thing, you know, in, in not allowing you to yes. go back to your village that could have set you off, made it worse and giving you all that extra care and attention? Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like they handled mm-hmm. it really, really well. And I'm really grateful I'm really grateful to Mike and to Arlene and to mm-hmm. just everyone um, because I feel like they did do what was best mm-hmm. in my best interest. And then also, especially, you know, thanks to that other fellow volunteer who pressured, pressured you and yeah, said, no, like, you, you need to, to reach out to someone. Yeah. Without her, I don't know where I would be. Mm-hmm. And then I guess I have a, just a general question about that. So how in in your experience, what are some of the signs that people should be looking out for both in themselves and, and their fellow volunteers or, or just in daily life and, you know, friends and family right. that could maybe tr- show a, a signs, signs of initial mental health issues or concerns, potential problems so that they can encourage other people to seek help or for themselves to, to reach out to somebody. So in my experience with depression, it's been like, I'll start to isolate myself. If someone's isolating themselves a lot, if they're eating a lot more or a lot less than normal, 
mm-hmm. if they're sleeping a lot more than normal, um, if they don't seem interested in things that they used to love doing, mm-hmm. um, that's called anhedonia is when you like lose pleasure in things that you once enjoyed. Um, yeah, those are, I would say those are like the big four for depression. Mm-hmm. Um, but people can have so many other mental health issues like anxiety and bipolar disorder and just all, all sorts of stuff, PTSD. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it really just depends on what they're experiencing, but if they're not acting like themselves, like if you've gotten to know them and they're not acting like they usually would, you may want to say to them, Hey, like, have you thought about talking to a PCMO or Hey, have you thought about talking to someone you trust about this? Or Hey, have you, have, you know, what's going on with you? Would you like me to talk to you about it? Mm-hmm. And then I, I mean, just being a Peace Corps volunteer myself, being in the Peace Corps just adds a whole other layer of complexity because yeah. for me, I served in a village alone. So I would have no person to to recognize that because I didn't see fellow volunteers for a month, month and a half at a time usually. So you, you may not have that person to recognize that there's an issue and then, you know, no fault to the, to the people that are in your community, but they already think that, you know, oh, you're an American. You're, you know, you're okay. kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. Amer- American is just being an American. Okay. They're being antisocial or they don't want to come out of their house, you know, whatever. And at the same time, as a volunteer, you know, it's going to be hard. So you might just shirk it off and say, no, this is just, this is just how it is. Like I'm, I'm going through a hard time, but it's hard for everybody. But they're, becomes a point where it's not normal difficulty it's something else yeah so there's a point when it becomes pathological and that that would be like when it becomes when it comes to the point where it's interfering with your daily life Mm -hmm. that's that's like the point when you probably should seek out help Mm -hmm. like if you're if you're if you're a little sad you're a little homesick but it's not making you like stay in bed all day Mm -hmm. then you're probably going to be able to deal with that on your own or by talking to a friend. Mm -hmm. But if you're like, if it's impacting your your day to day living, it's time to reach out for help. Mm -hmm. And in your own experience, do you have any tips for people that relate to sort of self care? So what are things that volunteers can do to make sure that they are keeping their emotions? I wouldn't say in check, but, uh, recognizing what's going on and not, I guess, pushing themselves too hard. Because you first and foremost, you need to take care of yourself or you're not mm. going to be able to serve your community. So what are some things in your own experience that volunteers can do? So first of all, if you're not already serving in country, if you're if you're <clears throat> if you've been accepted to the Peace Corps but you haven't gone yet, pack some things in your suitcase that are super comforting to you. Like I packed my sweet cinnamon pumpkin from Bath and Body Works because it's my favorite smell. And Mm -hmm. I packed my Harry Potter DVDs because I knew like if I was having a bad day, Mm -hmm. like we were talking about earlier, that's one of my coping skills. No, I watched Um, every every single video, as I told you before we started, like that was one of my comfort things of just watching Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's simple, but but it can be such a big help. So, so what, what else? Um, so if you don't have those things and you're already in, in country, like taking a walk, doing some yoga, taking some deep breaths, finding time for yourself, Mm -hmm. reading, journaling really, really helps me. Um, and I'm not always great about keeping a journal, but I, I usually do. And it, always really helps me sort of realize what's going on with me Mm -hmm. and it helps me notice excuse me if it's if it's time for me to reach out to someone usually like my journal reflects that Mm -hmm. um but it's a great form of self-care as well Mm -hmm. um getting involved in your community can really help like i was i was supposed to start baking at this bakery with these women in my village and i was really excited about it but then i got sick and had to go home but doing little things that are exciting to you like if you love to bake and if there's an oven somewhere in your village and someone will allow you to like make make cookies and share them with people mm-hmm. um i baked bread in our training village a lot to share and i made cookies several times because baking is a form of self-care for me but i was lucky that we had an oven so mm-hmm. I know 
realistically, not all peace, not most Peace Corps volunteers probably don't have access to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but eating a food you really like can be self care. Lighting a candle and just relaxing can be self care. Taking a nap can be self care. Mm-hmm. No, all all good things. So then bringing it back to your Peace Corps service, you know, you weren't there long, but any time that you were there was going to be, you know, extremely impactful. So what do you miss about Peace Corps? I miss my host families. They Mm. were amazing. I had, you know, the two host families because I had the pre-service training host family and then the permanent host family, and I still talk with them. Um, I miss the Peace Corps volunteers, I'm only really in touch with a couple because, uh, while I was not doing well, I did some stuff I'm not proud of. Um, Mm. I, we went during one of the trainings, we were like all sort of drinking, but I got like drunk and told a story that was not mine to tell. Mm -hmm. And I'm ashamed of that and embarrassed of that and feel really bad about it. And, and it's probably one of the reasons why I'm not in touch with more people from mm-hmm. Peace Corps. And then is there something that you learned from this experience? You know, you didn't, by far didn't have a stereotypical Peace Corps experience. But yeah. what, what, what did you learn from your time in South Africa? Um, I learned that people can be happy with very little mm-hmm. and that I can, I can live without a lot of things, which I'm, really, if if I turned this camera around, you'd see I'm really bad at that, (laughs) but, uh, I'm capable of it and I know that I'm capable of it. And I feel like that will be helpful in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, but people were happy even when they didn't have a lot of stuff, even when they didn't have a lot of money, even, um, when things weren't going well for them. And so I, I try to be happy when Mm -hmm. I can, um, I try to remember to experience joy when it's there Mm -hmm. because if you numb yourself to the bad emotions, you numb yourself to the good emotions too. Mm -hmm. Very important. Mm -hmm. And since you have a a captive audience of people interested in Peace Corps, serving in Peace Corps return, or just, just people listening to this podcast, is there anything else that you want to share from your experience? Um, yes. If you feel like you're not doing well, please, please, please ask for help. They won't try to medically separate you first off. They want to help you. They want you to stay in country. They want you to be able to complete your service. Um, so please don't be afraid to ask for help. Mm -hmm. No, very important that, you know, reach out and, and get the help that you need if you're going through something. And also, if anyone from Peace Corps South Africa 28 is listening to this, I am sorry for anything I did that was hurtful. Mm, well, hopefully they hear that. Well. Yeah. Well, I like to end with a local quote or saying, and you shared one that is absolutely excellent and very fitting for the conversation uh, that we've been having. So uh, what is that quote that you'd like to share with everybody? It's Ke Tabela Hohotsiba, and it means I am happy to know you. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show today, and I'm extremely happy to know you and to provide you with an opportunity to share your story and to express the importance of, self, of self-care and recognizing potential issues of mental health disorders so people can take the necessary steps to keep themselves healthy and their loved ones healthy as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's been wonderful being on the show. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening to today's show. If you don't know, September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Suicidal thoughts, much like mental health conditions, can affect anyone, regardless of age, gender, or background. In fact, suicide is often the result of an untreated mental health condition. Suicidal thoughts, although common, should not be considered normal and often indicate more serious issues. Every year, more than 14,000 individuals die by suicide, leaving behind their friends and family members to navigate the tragedy of loss. If you are a loved one 
or having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. Once again, that is 1-800-273-8255. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline helps prevent suicide. The Lifeline provides 24-7 free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention, and crisis resources for you or your loved ones. I wish you all the very best, and until next time, peace.